to go with number two. Hi, I'm Frank Uli, the creator and producer of Nick Guy Private Eye, and I would like to take a moment to tell you a little bit about this audio drama series. We are living in a culture that is growing increasingly more antagonistic toward the Christian faith. The church is becoming more and more countercultural as we find ourselves in conflict with what is being considered socially acceptable and morally sound. Many put forth claims that God and His Word are, at best, irrelevant or at worst, dangerous. Much of what we believe is misrepresented or misunderstood. All of this has the effect of marginalizing the Christian faith, which hinders the work of the gospel. This being the case, there is a real need for the people of God to be able to give a good, solid, reasoned defense for the Christian faith. 1 Peter 3.15 says that we should always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you. It is with this admonition in mind that we have produced the Nick Guy Private Eye Apologetic Series. In this audio drama series, we combine comedy with adventure to help equip the church to be able to give an answer to those who question the doctrines or the validity of the Christian faith. Nick Guy, Private Eye, first made an appearance in the spring of 2010. This initial installment, an Easter special, was entitled Nick Guy and the Empty Tomb Affair. Nick Guy, aided by his faithful friend and assistant, Dr. DeSoto, was hired to discover what happened to the body of Jesus three days after it was laid in the tomb. Since then, his investigations have included the evolution creation debate, the truth about Christian history, the true meaning of liberty, and what it means to be merciful to judge, and to be poor in spirit. He has tackled many topics that are currently being debated in our culture, such as capitalism versus socialism, or subjective feelings versus objective reality. And he has uncovered how to understand and defend these issues from a Christian worldview. In this series, we deal with arguments for and against biblical truth. We examine the evidence, weigh the options, and show how the Bible is true and its accounts are most reasonable and logical. Our goal is to equip the saints of God to both encourage them in their faith and to provide them with a useful tool in sharing the gospel. The series is entertaining, funny, and thrilling, as well as educational and encouraging. It's a great series for both young and old, and one you will be able to enjoy and refer to over and over again. Along with original storylines, Nick Guy Private Eye series has also included a number of adaptations of popular tales. For instance, our version of Dickens' Christmas Carol tells the story of Silas Ebenezer, a kind and generous man who becomes bitter and vengeful when he has shown how those in his past and present have used and taken advantage of him. In the end, God uses this revelation to further reveal a vital truth that all men need to understand if they are to be saved. We have also presented the story of It's a Wonderful Life from the perspective of the miserable, bitter old Mr. Potter. In the spring of 2019, we released our first musical, Nick Guy and the Wizard is Odd Affair, which presents the story of a Kansas farm girl named Dottie who travels to a strange land in her longing to find peace with God. The Nick Guy series has been blessed by the vocal talents of some incredible voice actors. Frank Uli, Rebecca Bradford, Paul, Susan, and Thomas Uli, Sarah Wyatt, John Bradford, Lorenda Ray Edwards, Nathan DeMolo, Glenn Haskell, Brittany McKay, and Kat Sneed have all lent their voices to making the Nick Guy Private Eye Apologetic series come to life. <laughs> To help you get an idea of what the Nick Guy Private Eye Apologetic Series is like, we would like to now present one 25-minute episode from one of our installments. In this episode, entitled Nick Guy and the With Me Against Me Affair, we deal with two scriptures that seem to be contradictory. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 40, Jesus states that the one who is not against us is for us. But then, in Matthew 12, verse 30, he says, whoever is not with me is against me. Well, how do 
do we reconcile these perhaps contradictory and at least confusing statements? Well, along with unpacking these scriptures, we also tackle the question, why does it matter? For people living in the 21st century, what difference does it make whether we are with Jesus or against him? For this installment in the Nick Guy series, Nick Guy and Dr. DeSoto go undercover to discover who is threatening the cast and crew of a production of Stanley Shakespeare's play, Spamlet. When we pick up the action in Act 2, after rescuing Mrs. Harridan, the play's producer, from a venomous snake, Nick Guy seeks some information from his favorite informant, Loose Lips Louie. Well, here then is Act 2 of Nick Guy and the With Me, Against Me affair. It's time now for another exciting adventure from the case files of one of the most brilliant minds in all of crime-fighting history, Nick Guy, Private Eye. When we left our heroes last time, they had been hired by the promising stage actress, Viola Starlet, to investigate threats that had been made against the cast and crew of a stage production of Stanley Shakespeare's play, Spamlet. Going undercover at the Royal Orb Theater as representatives of the newly formed Cast and Crew Reasonableness and Rectitude and Treatment Association, Nick Guy and Dr. DeSoto had just met the various participants of the theater company. But even before this initial visit was over, Mrs. Harridan, the producer of the play, gave out a cry for help. Help! Help! Someone help me! Rushing to her aid, they found her trapped in the corner of her office with a rattlesnake on the floor preparing to strike. Fortunately, Mr. Peavy, the Royal Orb Theater's security guard, subdued the intruder with a two-by-four. Yeah, that ought to do it. As Mr. Peavy left to return the snake to Dr. Bungler's traveling reptile circus on exhibit at Kenny's Reptile and Amphibian Shack right next door to the theater, Nick Guy decides to pay a visit to his favorite informant, Loose Lips Louie. With Dr. DeSoto and their client, Viola Starlet, Nick Guy finds Loose Lips Louie at his favorite booth at his favorite restaurant, the small diner with the long menu. We pick up the action now as Loose Lips Louie speaks. Oh, Nick Guy, Dr. DeSoto, how good to see you again. And you don't have to tell me who this young lady is. Viola Starlet, one of my favorite actresses, starring in one of my favorite plays, Spamlet. So you're a fan of Stanley Shakespeare? Oh, I like it when he says, to be or not to be. What was the question? We didn't come here to listen to you recite lines from the play, Louis. We need some information about members of the cast and crew. Oh, sure. What do you want to know? Well, first of all, what can you tell us about the play's producer, Mrs. Eridan? Well, her background is in television. She's been the owner and general manager of the biggest television station in town. Recently, she decided to expand into the theater. Well, she sunk a lot of money into this production of Spamlet, but along with a lot of money, she also has a lot of radical ideas about how to make a theater more appealing to a younger audience. Uh, We actually got a taste of that in our first encounter with her. She wants to make wholesale changes to the script. That's right. For instance, she wants to add a scene where King Spamlet's advisors form a conga line to celebrate his decision to make his daughter, Princess Ophelia, heir to the throne. I can't imagine those changes going over very well among the more seasoned Stanley Shakespearean actors among the cast. Well, that's especially true of the play's director, Olivier Raffazelli. He's what you might call a Stanley Shakespearean purist. Mr. Raffazelli and Mrs. Harridan argued daily over her suggestions. There's certainly no love lost between the two. In fact, it was Olivier Raffazelli who blackballed Mrs. Harridan from membership in the Stanley Shakespeare Admiration Society. Mrs. Harridan wanted to get in as a way of giving her production more prestige, but Raffazelli wouldn't stand for it. He went so far as to declare, We must not allow her in. She is not with us. She is against us. That's interesting. I hate to change the subject, but that reminds me of something I just read last night. Uh, What's that? I was reading in the Bible, in the Gospel of Mark, where the disciples of Jesus said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Oh, that's Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 41. But Jesus told them that they shouldn't stop the man from doing what he was doing. Now, what exactly did he say again? 
He said, For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Yes, for the one who is not against us is for us. Uh, yes, that's right. Well, it reminded me of the conversation you and Nick Guy were having when I first met you. You know, where you were discussing that poll that revealed the many widely disparate views that people have about Jesus? Uh, yes, of course. As I recall, both you and Nick Guy were a bit disturbed that so many people have so many different views of Jesus. But doesn't this section of the Gospel of Mark tell us that it doesn't really matter what we believe about Jesus, just as long as we do believe in him? Uh, well, no, not exactly. Like all of Scripture, it's vital that we read it in context in order to interpret it correctly. In essence, what the disciples were saying to Jesus was that they prohibited someone from healing in the name of Jesus because he wasn't part of their particular group. He wasn't one of the twelve disciples. Jesus was speaking out against what we might call exclusivism and, by extension, a sort of pridefulness. Although the man casting out demons wasn't one of the twelve disciples, he was still a follower of Jesus. So... We shouldn't consider someone not a follower of Jesus just because they don't belong to our particular church or our particular group? That's right. There are matters that are essential to the Christian faith, but being a member of a particular congregation isn't one of them. We must recognize our unity with all who legitimately claim the name of Christ. But of course, this claim must be based upon the truth of who Christ is. Thank you for clearing that up. Uh, my pleasure. But what hasn't been cleared up is who is behind these threats and now actual attacks on the cast and crew of Spamlet. It's obvious Olivier Refazelli has a motive to harm Mrs. Herodin, but does he have a motive to threaten or harm the whole cast? Uh, well, could it be that the threats are simply a smokescreen to throw us off the scent? I believe there's more to this whole affair than meets the eye. <laughs> Nick Guy and I returned with Viola Starlet back to the Royal Orb Theater. There we were greeted by Mr. Peavy. Uh, well, hello there, Miss Starlet. Hello, Mr. Peavy. Hello, Mr. Peavy. Oh, it's you two again. Uh, like I told you before, I can't let you in unless I receive a notification from that screwball organization you're with telling me that you're coming. And then you'll need to provide some sort of identification. But we did get in here. Uh, hold it. Did you hear that? It sounded like Oliver, Mrs. Hilkiah's missing cat. He's over there, behind the concession stand. Oh, I've got him now. With Mr. Peavy distracted, Nick Guy and I followed Viola Starlet down to the lower level of the theater. I would like to go through Olivier Refazelli's office, if he's the one who's been sending those threats, and the one who set that rattlesnake loose on Mrs. Harridan, we might find a clue there. You are an incorrigible traitor to the works of Stanley Shakespeare, madam. I simply want to make some minor adaptations. Minor adaptations? You want to have everyone drinking diet sodas at the big banquet scene. It's what's known as product placement. We need the revenue. I cannot, I will not stand for such an outrage. Olivier Refazelli exited Mrs. Harridan's office and slammed the door. He then quickly walked right past us. Of all the insufferable gall! Then, just as he passed us, Molly Demure came running after him. Mr. Refazelli, can I have a moment of your time, sir? I I've been working on a new scene that I would like to get your opinion on, sir. Uh, sir, could you please wait up? Well, it looks as if it's safe to look around his office. We entered Olivier Refazelli's office, but found nothing that pointed to him being the one responsible for the threats on the cast and crew, nor for the attack on Mrs. Herodin. We left his office and had just walked into the hall as Molly Demure returned from her pursuit of Mr. Refazelli. Nothing I ever do is good enough for that man. Molly, is everything all right? You do seem rather upset, ma'am. What? Oh, no, it's nothing. Well, actually, it is something. As you know, I want to be an actress. I took this job as wardrobe supervisor to get access to Mr. Raffazelli, but every time I want to talk with him or audition my talents for him, he just brushes me off. He won't give me the time of day. That's not fair. That's not right. That's not nice. Don't take it personally, Molly. I've experienced plenty of rejection when I was first starting out. 
I've been over backwards to accommodate every costume demand he has. I make every adjustment he wants. I get here early, I work late. You would think he could spare just a moment of time to help a young aspiring actress in her quest to, you know, become a star. Well, I'm certain that your perseverance will pay off. If not with Mr. Raffazelli, then certainly with someone else. Molly, is that you out in the hall, my dear? Yes, Mrs. Harridan. Come here, please. I need to see you. Yes, ma'am. Well, what do we do now, Guy? Well, I guess we just keep our eyes open and wait for something else to happen. No sooner had Nick Guy uttered these words when we heard Olivier Raffazelli's voice resound through the theater. Someone lend me a hand. I'm trapped. We followed the sound of his voice to the stage. There we found Mr. Raffazelli trapped under the weight of a sandbag that had fallen from the scaffolding just above the stage. Mr. Raffazelli, are you all right? Of course I'm not all right. I'm stuck here. There is this heavy sandbag on top of me. Well, let's try to lift it off, DeSoto. Nick Guy and I struggled, but we're finally able to free Olivier Raffazelli. <laughs> There. Well, this wooden frame from this backdrop took most of the weight from the sandbag when it fell. It's a good thing it was here. You call that a good thing? No, a good thing would have been if I'd not been standing there when that sandbag fell. What were you doing? I am planning to restage scene five from act three and was checking the lighting from this corner. Well, it looks like somebody was deliberately trying to hurt you. Hurt me? Don't be absurd. Why would anyone want to hurt me? Well, how can you be so sure? Look at the rope that was holding the weighted sandbag. Why, it looks as if it's been cut. Well, that weight was hanging by no more than a thread. The Royal Orb Theater is a grand auditorium, but it is in need of some maintenance. Look around. There are floorboards that are loose. The furnace is old. The roof leaks. Even the candy dispensers have ten-year-old mints in them. Why, that rope has probably been worn for years. It just happened to give way at this moment in time. I wouldn't worry about it. Well, it certainly looks suspicious. It was just an accident. If it wasn't, the authorities would be inclined to close the show. And that I will not stand for. Now, if you will excuse me, I have work to do. Do you think it was just an accident, Nick Guy? Well, the theater could use a little work, but it just seems a little too coincidental that this particular rope gave way, just as Mr. Raffazelli was standing under this particular weighted sandbag. Oh! Hey, what was that? That's Douglas Mountbatten III. He's playing the Dying King's family. Oh, that's right. You told us that he's a method actor. He stays in character even when he's not performing. Well, maybe he saw something. Mr. Mountbatten, did you see... Mr. Mountbatten? Oh, he's, he's not responding. He's in character. He won't answer to his real name. You'll have to address him as King Spamlet. Oh, uh, well, King Spamlet. Yes, my lad? What dost thou require of me? This weighted sandbag just fell on Olivier Raffazelli. Did you see how it happened? Nay. How could I have? I lay dying, sir. Now please depart. I needest my rest. Oh! This is the second attempt to eliminate someone from the cast and crew. This is becoming more frightening by the moment. Well, let's go somewhere where we can sort this out. <laughs> We return to the lower level and into Viola Starlet's dressing room to confer. Well, we know that Mr. Raffazelli is opposed to Mrs. Harridan's attempts to modernize Stanley Shakespeare's play, so he has a motive to eliminate her. And the fact that Mr. Raffazelli blackballed Mrs. Harridan from becoming a member of the Stanley Shakespeare Admiration Society could give her a motive to eliminate him. But that rope had to be cut just at the right time for that weighted sandbag to fall on Mr. Raffazelli. And Mrs. Harridan was in her office when it did. Of course, Molly Demure had just returned from speaking with him, or, well, at least attempting to speak with him, and she was very upset with him. But I can't imagine that Molly would try to hurt anybody. She gets along with everybody, and everyone seems to like her. Well, everybody except Olivier Raffazelli, that is. 
Uh, but he doesn't dislike her. He's just uh, indifferent to her. And besides, Molly doesn't seem to have a motive to eliminate Mrs. Harridan. No. In fact, Mrs. Harridan has been especially kind to her. Molly is the daughter of one of Mrs. Harridan's dearest and oldest friends. Oh, there's the rehearsal bell. I've got to go. I do hope you can solve this whole issue once and for all. Nick Guy and I decided to watch the rehearsal from the back of the auditorium, hoping we might detect something that would provide us with a clue as to who was responsible for the attacks on Mrs. Harridan and Olivier Raffazelli. All of the actors were present and accounted for. Viola Starlet and Dahlia Parmenter were standing in the middle of the stage. Douglas Mountbatten III was lying in bed. Oh! Tony and Ostentatia Bland were standing in the wings. Ostentatia called over to Molly Demure and spoke to her. Molly, where is the ruby veil I'm supposed to be wearing? I don't know, Mrs. Bland. I thought I laid everything out in your dressing room for you. Well, I don't have it. You must have been negligent. Again. Oh, ma'am, I'm sure I wasn't... Don't stand there making feeble excuses. Go and get it. Yes, ma'am. Let us begin with Act 2, Scene 4. This is where Queen Gertrude is attempting to deceive her daughter, Princess Ophelia, by convincing her that King Spamlet is upset with her and has decided against her ascendancy to the throne. Is this my death scene? No, you will not die for another three acts yet. Oh! Oh! Please, Douglas, I would prefer if you did your suffering in silence. Douglas? Douglas? I mean, King Spamlet. Oh! Now, Dahlia Parmenter, Viola Starlet, take it from page five. Mother, you look cross. Whatever may the matter be. Tis your father, my dear affiliate. He is much ticked off at thee. Surely it taint so. Oh, surely tis so. And when I say tis, I mean tis. But I wouldst do nothing which should give him offense, I can assure you. Taint me you needs to sure, doll face. Cut, cut! What is all of this? Taint and doll face? Where did those lines come from? Mrs. Harridan gave us these revised scripts just this morning. But that kind of language is absurd. Is this where I moan? No, this is where I moan. Please discard those hideously revised scripts. We shall revert to the lines as originally written by Stanley Shakespeare. But Mrs. Harridan said... I shall deal with Mrs. Harridan, and I shall bring this whole matter to a head. Once... And for all. Mr. Raffazelli called for a break in order to retrieve the original copies of the script. Meanwhile, Ostentatia Bland had grown impatient waiting for Molly to return with her ruby veil. Oh, where is that incompetent girl? It appears that I must see to this whole matter myself. As Ostentatia Bland left the stage, Nick Guy turned to me and spoke. Hmm, well, it seems as if there is more than just a little bit of hostility in this group, DeSoto, and I have to admit that more than a few of these people are less than likable. Ah, there's something here we're missing. We're just going to have to keep our senses alert. Both Olivier Raffazelli and Ostentatia Bland return to the stage at about the same time. I couldn't find that pathetic girl anywhere. I would just have to do without my ruby veil, I'm afraid. Mr. Raffazelli distributed new copies of the script to each of the actors. Well, actually, they were old copies of the script. And he was just about to resume the rehearsal when we heard a moan. Oh! Douglas! I mean, King Spamlet! You don't die quite yet. T'wasn't me, my lord. It wasn't? Do we have another method actor in the troupe? Oh, help! Uh, somebody help! That's Molly. She's in trouble. Let's go! Help! Help! Somebody please help me! We followed the sound of Molly's voice down into the lower level and into the costume storage room. There we found her caught up in a dark corner of the room with a robe wrapped around her neck. The robe was going through an automatic pressing machine and was drawing tighter and tighter around her neck. Nick Guy turned off the pressing machine while I freed her from the room. Oh, thank you, thank you. Another few seconds and it would have been over. Uh, what happened? I don't know for sure. 
I mean, I came down here to look for the ruby veil for Mrs. Bland's costume, and the next thing I know, I was I was pushed to the floor. Someone pushed you? I must have been knocked unconscious. And when I came to, I had this rope around my neck, and it was pulling tighter and tighter. She wasn't pushed. She's a clumsy oaf of a girl. No doubt she tripped. Oh, no. I was pushed. I'm sure of it. Uh Uh-huh. Do you hear that? It's that cat that's been running loose throughout the theater. Silly girl probably tripped over him. Hey, what's going on down here? Lord Peavy, methinks thou shouldst be on thine toes. There is something rotten here, and tis not an egg. Hey, what kind of mumbo-jumbo is that coming out of your mouth? Speak English so I can understand you. I think he's trying to say that there are a lot of suspicious things going on around here. Uh, don't worry about that. Nothing gets by me. Uh, like these two fellas from the CCRARTA. Now, I know I haven't received any notification that they're supposed to be here, and they haven't shown me any identification yet. Now, that's suspicious, and they're both headed for trouble. I can tell you... Aha! Yeah. Uh-huh, he's here! That pesky cat's here. Well, just let me get my hands on him! Everyone returned to the stage to finish the rehearsal. Afterward, we met with our client, Viola Starlet, in her dressing room to try to sort through all that had happened. I don't understand why anyone would try to hurt Molly. Everybody in the cast and crew likes her. Well, everybody except Austin Tasha Bland and Olivier Refazelli ignores her and doesn't seem too fond of her. But I can't imagine either of them wanting to harm her. Well, Ostentatia wasn't with us when Molly got entangled in the robe. In fact, she left to look for her. But even though Ostentatia Bland doesn't like Molly, uh, that hardly constitutes a clear-cut motive. Do you think it was just an accident? Is it possible that Molly did trip over the cat, and in the fall she got tangled up in that robe? Uh, But who turned on the automatic pressing machine? Well, perhaps Ostentatia Bland lied when she said she couldn't find Molly. Maybe she did find her and pushed her and wrapped her up in that robe. But even if Ostentatia did attack Molly, what would be her motive for attacking Olivier Raffazelli or or Mrs. Harridan? Mr. Raffazelli is a big fan of her work. He treats her like royalty. And Mrs. Harridan worked very hard to get her to sign on to play the part of Lady Pompous. Well, we don't seem to be any closer to solving this mystery. In fact, it seems to be getting more and more confusing. Now, what was that? That sounded like Tony Bland. And it sounds as if he's in trouble. We rushed to Tony Bland's dressing room, where we were joined by the actress Dahlia Palmenter, the play's producer, Mrs. Harridan, and the play's director, Olivier Raffazelli. Tony Bland was sitting in his desk with a letter in his hands. Please say it isn't so. What's going on? Are you all right? All right? No, tis a terrible fate that has befallen me. A worse fate than a less than terrible fate. Uh, What happened? This letter. Do you see this letter? What's in it? Is it a threat against you? Oh, tis far worse. Let me see that. As the play's producer, Mrs. Herdon, you will no doubt understand my woe. It appears to be a fan letter. Ah, but there's the rub. It only appears to be a fan letter. The writer says how much she's looking forward to seeing your performance in Spamlet. But then should encourage you. Uh Aha! But then she writes about how excited she is to see unknown actors have their chance to star in big productions. She obviously knows nothing about me. She doesn't know who I am. My past greatness is being forgotten. My star is fading. Oh, this is terrible. Your star is fading because you're a fading star. Tony Bland, you are a has-been. You should be comforted by the fact that anyone bothered to write you at all. Just then, Tony's wife, Ostentatia, entered the room. Oh, what's going on? I was clear on the other side of the theater when I heard you wailing, my dear. Are you quite all right? A wretched soul as I. Man bids me quiet when hears my cry, and burden on my deep despair, and yet demands, shut your trap out there. Hmm. Uh, You look like you have an idea, Guy. Uh, What is it? Well, I'm not quite sure, but I'm sure that it's important to the case. (laughs) 
Well, the action is coming quite quickly now, and with each new development, the plot continues to thicken. Who's behind all of these attacks and why? You'll want to be with us next time when we hear Nick Guy say, These theater people get attacked more frequently than I do. So be sure to join us again next time for another exciting installment of Nick Guy, Private Eye. Ward Stang speaking. In conclusion, some have categorized Christianity as being a blind faith, the implication being that Christians believe in something that is unreasonable. Well, this notion has led critics of Christianity to dismiss its claims as being illogical, unscientific, and irrational. And many times what we believe comes into direct conflict with the philosophies, the agendas, and the morality of portions of our society. First of all, our faith in God is not unreasonable, nor is it blind. God has provided sufficient evidence of his existence and proven himself true to his word. Now, certainly there are a number of things about God that are foreign to human logic and reason, such as the doctrine of the Trinity. But when dealing with a supernatural being such as God, there will inevitably be things about him and his character and actions that are beyond our understanding and hard for us to comprehend. But it is God's true track record of evidence and trustworthiness in those things we can comprehend that enables us to trust him with those things that are beyond our ability to understand. The Nick Guy Private Eye Apologetic Series was designed to unravel these issues, to work through these supposedly contradictory or difficult portions of scripture and discover the truth they proclaim and then apply that truth to the philosophies, agendas, and morality of our culture. Our goal is to help equip the average believer to be able to defend the Christian faith and to be able to give a good, solid reason for the hope that is within them, boldly proclaiming truth in the public square in an hour such as ours. Well, to learn more about the Nick Guy Private Eye Apologetic Series and its companion series, The Human Eel, visit our website at www.nickguy.net. Or you can go to the Nick Guy Private Eye Facebook page. Or you can write to us at P.O. Box 781, Painesville, Ohio, 44077. And discover that sometimes the most amazing things must be true. True.